Welcome to Beer Net Radio. Listen to on every continent except Antarctica. B double E double E R R N E T N E T Beer. Beer Net Radio. Hey Jordan. Hey Jen. Am I How's it going? pretty pretty good? Am, am I too loud? No. Really? Yeah. You sound okay. good. Maybe I broke the computer just enough <laughs> to where it just damaged my speakers just enough. Let me see if I can rename myself here. I will stifle the urge to name myself something funny, <laughs> like poo poo pants. Okay. Well, guess Harry, what? Harry would love that when he comes back, though. <laughs> um. All right. Well, Michael Sargent's at the door. Do you hear that, Jay? <laughs> okay, perfect. You go by Sarge or or Mike or Michael? Well, there's a few uh, Mikes born in the millennial generation. So usually <laughs> Michael on formal introductions gets watered down to Mike and then eventually it becomes Sarge based on my last name. So now that we're all friends, that Sarge is perfectly fine. There we Sweet. Go. Sarge of 12.5 Beverage Company, welcome yeah. to BeerNet Radio. Yeah, I got uh, my podcast, Mike, even though it's my first podcast, my uh, father-in-law works for sure, Mike. So appreciate your support, Jordan. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. So is the volume good? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you sound perfect. All right. Well, yeah, great to meet you guys. Thanks for having uh, a small up and coming brewery on the uh, on the talk today. Absolutely. And uh, so it is Monday at 1 CST, but I, you know, it is coffee. It's hard right. coffee. Yeah. So I did, you know, I have about four ounces Perfect. <laughs> of the vanilla latte. It's only 5%, right? I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. Good, that's water that's back it. in the old days, right? You know. Yeah, easy, easy drink. <laughs> it is, it is tasty. We do not write about taste in, in uh, you know, BBD, but to me, it is tasty. Um, so yeah, let's talk about all, you guys have lots of product lines, right? You've got your hard uh, yeah. behind you, which is. Yeah, I've got but, a collection of, of you know, off, off the production line, uh, cans over here between hard juice and our hard, hard brunch offering, which is a combination of our hard coffee, but then also, uh, orange mimosa, peach bellini and strawberry sangria. So the, uh, variety pack is being packed as we speak and, and we'll be hitting the market here in the month and then we'll be available all summer long. But yeah, it's definitely been a, a growing journey. When I started, uh, September of 2020, we were amidst a pandemic plus a rebrand. Um, we actually, had a previous brand called Brown Bomber that um, had the same great hard coffee liquid uh, in 13 ounce, 13.7 ounce glass bottles and, and did some work to really put, put a brand in play that could grow the way we wanted to, which was beyond coffee. We started in coffee and we have a, a great expertise in the hard coffee um, piece of it, but we wanted to really be a flavor malt beverage experience brand. And so that's where hard tea came into play last year with the test market and we're expanding this year and then hard juice. Um, you know, as a new platform, it's not necessarily exact, exactly been done the way we're doing it. So it's not maybe as new as hard coffee innovation and not as more established like a hard tea category, but we're pretty bullish on where that can go for us and flavor and experience is really what the brand's all about. Cool. Yeah. Well, I want to definitely drill drill down more into all of that, but mm -hmm. first, um, so, <clears throat> so 12.5 now you're called, right? That was founded in 2020 or 2018? Uh, towards the tw end of 2018. So okay. uh, we were actually approached um, through a mutual friend uh, to produce a hard coffee for, for another company. Uh, and so we actually launched the Brown Bomber brand in advance of that towards the end of 2018, moving into 2019. And then some others started to hit the marketplace in 2019 and 2020 and so on. So um, wanted to test and learn because we, we had great tasting liquid and, and we're a little uh, anxious, you know, we're an entrepreneurial group. So we wanted to make sure we got the great liquid to market and learn that, you know, as people like liquid, a little confusing on the name, even though I had a little, um, you know, propeller and had, had aviation nods to it, people didn't quite get it as much. And so that's where I took on an exercise to really rebrand with 12.5 being the beverage company. And that date was thoughtfully plucked from uh, the prohibition repeal of December 5th, 1933. So that's where the 12.5 comes into play, but then the, the rebel brand kind of giving us more ability to go into uh, different categories. Well, it says that, I mean, you guys have on, on your webpage, you're the founder of the hard coffee category. Is that true? Yeah. So we, we, crafted the flavor malt beverage liquid that you have uh, in front of you, you know, for Brown Bomber, but then also we have had a few other uh, co-manufacturing partners along the way. So um, 
we are one of a handful of few facilities that can actually make non-alcoholic and alcoholic uh, ready to drink coffees. You know, so if you're reading anything in the non-elk side of the business, that's, you know, multiple billions of dollars of ready to drink uh, lattes that are having also some shortfalls, you know, from supply chain issues because people aren't vertically integrated. So we do have a partnership uh, with Trillion Food Nutrition and Horseshoe Beverage Company that has one of the handful of few facilities that can actually produce, you know, ready to drink shelf stable lattes, elk or non elk. Okay. So you guys were among the first to really do this dedicated hard coffee. Yeah. Yeah. As, as, as you would see it here, I mean, people have been drinking hard coffee and making their own home sure. cocktails for, for a long, longer than we've probably all been around. But as a easy, ready to drink uh, offering, which started in glasses now and in cans, that's, you know, that was definitely uh, one of the first markets. And was it, I mean, I would think part of the reason, you know, it seems like to your point, people make their own. It seems like this idea is long overdue, but after Four Loco had to remove caffeine from their product, some people are probably, were probably gun shy to get into it, right? But you guys, what, I mean, you knew it has to be naturally occurring and then it's okay, right? Yeah, yeah, we use a naturally occurring, uh, you know, decaf bean, you know, 100% Arabica. So it's it's not, it's not what, uh, you know, whatever 2010 was going on. I had a roommate that drank a few four locos before a Halloween party and he never left the apartment. That was, that was a different type of situation at a different time. So, um, you know, it's all, all within specs, but it's, it's probably a half a cup of coffee equivalent through the naturally occurring decaf. So you're, if you're sensitive to caffeine, I suppose you could get, you know, get a little bit of the caffeine effects, but, uh, it's, it's not, not, not nearly as strong as a regular cup of coffee. Got it. Cool. Um, yeah, cool. Good to know. Four for logo ruined it for, they ruined it for everybody. You know, yeah. Right. Overdo it. Overdo it now. No, yeah. it's all about moderation. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Well, so I'm, I'm so curious, is your flagship product, the, the rebel mix packs, is that your fact, what does the most volume for you guys? It's, it's uh, catching up. So what, uh, if we, we talked a year ago at this time, we would have just launched the variety pack. Um, so at, at this time last year, we had our uh, mocha four pack, vanilla four pack had just launched a limited release with Irish cream four packs for St. Patrick's day, just uh, starting to ship and have for Memorial day, a berry crisp hard latte. Um, and then the other variety pack. So we've, we've definitely come a long way in the last year and a half. So we, we do see a lot uh, higher turns on the variety packs, okay. um, you know, definitely a higher price point. So we're definitely monitoring that situation with high inflation and, and people having a finite amount of dollars to spend in the store, uh, especially if it's going all into the gas tank, it seems these days. Yeah. But uh, we definitely have seen good success in that. And then that actually gave way to our Winter Wonderland pack, which was a seasonal release in limited fashion last, um, you know, last holiday season. So we're seeing seeing a lot of good opportunities for seasonal executions within variety pack as well. Cool. Cool. And it's and then, an eight pack versus, you know, a 12 or a 24 because it's different type of drinking, you know, liquid. It's not, it's a heavier latte liquid. So we don't expect people to have, uh, you know, lots of these, a lot of the surveys and folks we talk to have one or two, just something to kind of, you know, start the, the drinking session off, if you will. And that's kind of where our tagline, the perfect first drink comes into play because we don't want to displace your wine at dinner or your other beverage over the course of a session. You know, we can be that first first drink and then you can kind of move on and experiment. And that's why we have tea and, and juice. Cool. And then um, <clears throat> just, you know, kind of one more for me and then I'll pass it on to Jordan. Um, can you share, you know, how many CEs you'll do this year or gallons or, or however you guys benchmark? Yeah, we're benchmarking on cases. Uh, won't probably throw out a specific number, but we have a, a pretty healthy six figure. It's not, not over the 500,000 case quantity quite yet, but we were building plans to kind of get to that level and then, you know, a million cases in the future, but, but, uh, had about 43% growth last year in, okay. uh, case shipments and, and depletions aren't, aren't too far behind on that. So we've, we've seen great growth in a pandemic, which has been tough because you launched a, a new brand with newer liquid that it did exist before the pandemic, but sampling is, is super important. You know, a lot of folks will take a sip as you did and, and not know what to think going into it, but then they're like, wow, that's great. And we've seen conversion rates of 70, 80% when we do samplings, it's just been really tough, you know, with on-premise being shut down and then the samplings being regulated differently due to COVID. So uh, it seems most things are back open and, and folks that were even a little bit more hesitant getting back into samplings are allowing, allowing us to do that again. And then on-premise is a whole new world for us because we've never really had full bl- you know, full blown on-premise <laughs> opportunities in the last couple of years. Um, hey, Sarge. So hey, Sarge. I, I was wondering how mm-hmm. seasonal is hard coffee? Non-alcoholic coffee has more seasonality than I think what we've seen in, in hard really? coffee. Um, you know, if you have the first drink when it's a little bit cooler in the summer, you might not be drinking it unless it's poured over ice when it's maybe 90 out on the, on the boat per se, but uh, it, it, it has some seasonalities from shipment standpoint for releasing a seasonal, but, but the kind of day in and day out business is pretty consistent. A lot of the, the folks and surveys we've done with consumers, it's, it's not just a weekend drink. It's not just a, 
after work drink, it's, it's pretty flexible. And so that first drink could be a tailgate. It could be happy hour. Um, survey would say nobody drinks it after 10 PM. So we know it's maybe not the, you know, the drink at the end of the day or the end of the yeah. session. So it's, it's been pretty consistent, um, you know, but, but it's not quite as like peaking like dry coffee in, in, in the, the, uh, the winter months as much as you would think. Okay. And then all your seasonals, uh, cause y'all have a pretty extensive, uh, seasonal lineup. Is that all like October, November, December? Yeah, we can, we'll send you, a, I think the release calendar. So you guys can maybe have the infographic for it, but, uh, yeah, it's a quarterly release on the four packs, uh, a little bit more towards kind of a trimester release when it comes to the eight pack seasonals. And, um, you know, the brunch is a little bit of a hybrid because it's got mocha, you know, as the lead hard coffee in it, but it has some other opportunities as well. And so that, that may present itself as maybe not as a limited release as maybe more of a staple item. So it kind of varies, but our, our core lineup of mocha, vanilla, our variety pack, you know, that's 52 weeks a year. Uh, we did do a test with Costco Northeast that went pretty well as well on a 12 pack, which did include our Irish cream for St. Patrick's day. Um, you know, so that those opportunities have presented themselves. And we've been very fortunate to, to have great retail partners on, on those types of executions as well. But I would love to see, you know, a mocha four pack next to our core eight pack, you know, next to a, a seasonal execution, whether it's four or eight packs on display, you know, once a quarter, that'd be great for us. Very okay. competitive space, but you know, it'd be great to see it out on the floor. <laughs> for sure. And uh, the, the new, <clears throat> excuse me, hard juice pack. Mm -hmm. uh, how long has that been in market? We are literally packing as we speak and we'll start to ship into this week into next week. And so it's brand new execution for us. And, and like I said, it's a little bit of a different innovation because it's not taking on a industry that's been around for 21 plus years in tea. It's not really kind of inventing a category with hard coffee and somewhere in between. And, you know, it's a um, 5%, 100 calories, malt based and mixed with real juice and unique, uh, interesting flavors that consumers are looking for right now. So it's not, it's not a seltzer. Yeah, it's definitely uh, going to be flavor forward and, and, uh, you know, more, uh, more what you'd expect from a blood orange star fruit or a pineapple mango, you know, it has, has the weight of what you'd expect, you know, from a, a drink like a pineapple mango. And the new, um, brunch variety pack mm -hmm. that's, um, rolling kind of same, same timeline as time the frame. juice. Yeah. Okay. It's all, all kind of coming, uh, coming together here for summer. So that'll uh, be, um, you know, coming and, and shipping hopefully all in the same truck. Uh, we also do have a s'mores um, right, uh, four pack coming for summer that will go into the fall season as well. So if you're looking for the perfect first drink for a fire at the uh, yeah. <laughs> appropriate time, depending where you live in the country, whether it's uh, fire season seems to be everywhere now with some droughts, but you know, towards the fall, you know, couple that with pumpkin spice, that's pretty good, uh, pretty good right. fireside chat drink. The, uh, the brunch variety pack is very interesting because I don't think I've seen anything like that before. Uh, it, how yeah, did y'all kind of come up with that? Well, uh, you know, at the heart of the brand, it uh, started with flavor and experience and then experience varies by, by product line. Coffee is kind of more of a, wow, that's great. When do I drink it? Tea is I'm looking for something that's not seltzer with a smidge of tea and I'm looking for something lower sugar, low calories. Juice was kind of, all right, let's, let's put a little bit of fun and flavor into products that kind of been watered down from a flavor profile for a long time. Brunch was one where it's like, well, we feel like hard coffee has a right to win in brunch and for forever long, it's been mimosas and Bloody Marys, but there really isn't a brand per se attached to that. Unless you have a particular vodka or champagne or sparkling wine that you like to drink, you might have a brand associated with it. But it was one of those things. It's like, Hey, what do you think we could do? I mean, feature our hard coffee that a lot of people truthfully I haven't tried for the first time. And then also to couple it with some things that are easy to drink uh, that they're more familiar with. You know, they are malt-based beverages for the peach bellini and strawberry sangria and the orange mimosa. So um, it's not a, it's not a spirit base, but you know, having something that's flavorful and fun and an and occasion based too, because, you know, it's easy to understand when you sh should drink a brunch pack. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then just last question for me is um, I've seen some of the single serves, the 16 ounce, the 19.2. Yep. Uh, what kind of inroads are you making into the convenience channel? Yeah. So with, uh, our Boulder line, so that's the 16 ounce, um, hard coffee lineup that we launched. Uh, we just packed and started to ship that at the beginning of the year. So, you know, catching up a little bit to the cycles, um, which I think cycles of old are different now coming off of a C store conference a few weeks ago with the Winsight media group. It's like, well, if you just do it once or twice a year, you're going to be high because it's done the supply chain and the dynamics and how quickly the consumer is moving. So we're hoping to catch up in between cycles a little bit with the Boulder, but it's an 8% um, ABV product and then um, unique flavors there, double mocha and salted caramel. 
it's a it's a no brainer for C stores because the C stores we've been doing business with make um, have been doing well four packs and they definitely can do well with variety packs, but to have that right size, I think for, for what you'd expect and plus the right amount of liquid, I don't know that you'd want a hard coffee in a 19, two or 24 ounce. Maybe you do, but that's up to you. <laughs> but I think it's the right size liquid for that. And then on the tea side of it, that just really launched in the oh, last the uh, handful yeah. of months. So that's a 19, two hard tea. So when we test marketed last year, we had four packs of our original and half and half and then a variety pack. So then you know, really optimizing the mix this year was moving into the 19 twos with originals half and half and peach, and then complementing that with the the variety pack as well. So we're just getting into it, just getting started, but still plenty of uh, upside there. And even on premise could use, you know, a 16 ounce or a 19 two, depending on the occasion. Um, but you know, with on premise, that's one we really haven't tapped into a ton, but it's also a product that you can consume by itself, but it's also a great mixer when it comes to the coffee, you can add you can add vodka, you can add peanut butter whiskey, you can kind of really be a labor saving piece for on premise. And so I'm, I'm excited to get to talk to more on premise folks and see how that can, you know, impact our business in a positive way, because uh, everybody's strapped for labor. And if you don't have to handle the coffee, we handle the coffee, you just plus it up from there, it should be a, a great adult iced coffee. Yeah, <clears throat> so we talked about, you know, we were talking about sampling and on premise, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, and C store. So, um, Currently, what is your top channel? Is it grocery, liquor, or? Uh, those are definitely the top two. I'd say we probably are 60% independent driven, but uh, Total Wines are our top retailer. And then it gets a little bit more regional, but you know, we have Wegmans, we have Hy-Vee, we've got Albertsons Banners. Like I mentioned, we had a Costco test in the Northeast. Uh, you get down to Florida, we've had turns with Publix and we have ABC down there, HEB in Texas. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty robust retailer list, even though it's been hard to program the way we'd like, which was displays and samplings and mm -hmm. making sure people are, are understanding what hard coffee is all about. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah and on-premise, I have big hopes. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, it becomes a, a staple, if you will, for adult iced coffees and, and great cocktails. Um, in Pennsylvania, actually, some of the retailers up there make adult iced coffee slushies with our Ooh. products. And so yes. um, they do a lot of a lot of adult iced coffee up there too. So trying to take that concept. And like I said, you can margin up if you add some vodka or peanut butter whiskey and, and sell a pretty, pretty uh, good margined cocktail with our product as a base. And you guys are pretty, pretty well national, right? I think I read you're like 45 states. Yeah, we're, I think 46 states probably have okay. over 140 distributors at this point. So it has been a combination of building out our network with uh, beer distributors, but we do have some wine and spirits distributors. And then also bringing into the fold our partnership with Trilliant, uh, which has several non-alcoholic brands. And so we are distributing through our network, the Hostess non-alcoholic ready-to-drink lattes, as well as our um, sister company's brand Black Stag, uh, which, which is a newer brand on the marketplace, but has a full line of ready-to-drink uh, non-alcoholic co uh, coffees as well that's lower in sugar than the industry leader and lower calories and, and much better drinking experience overall. So we're really trying to leverage the network that started with hard coffee that's expanded into juice and tea, but also leverage the non-elk opportunities that we have, which is definitely plentiful on the ready to drink non-elk side if, you know, to the tune of billions of billions of dollars there. And as I mentioned, kind of out of stocks pretty much everywhere you go. Right. So forgive me for being green about this. So Trillient, are, do you guys always have, you don't always have the same distribution network, right? Or really it has the opportunity being non-elk, they can ship direct and through, you know, wholesalers right. that uh, aren't, aren't. Uh, three tier regulated, but uh, a lot of that is um, distributed in stores through through alcohol distributors today. So trying to leverage the right solution for the customer that it need, but you know, as as retailers struggle with labor as well, having a DSD network that we can bring elk and non elk solutions to the market is definitely definitely a lot of upside there for us as well as the retailers. Right, and the distributors, I'm sure they want yeah, both they have the vo elk volume and, the and margins definitely good on. <laughs> on right. a multiple billion dollar category of ready to drink coffee. Yeah, yeah. And do you guys tend to go with Molson Coors or Anheuser-Busch wholesalers when you're with beer guys or does it matter? Just we, we, have a, we have a mix of, mix of uh, both. Um, you know, it's, it's really kind of assessing the market and figuring out the right solution, you know, for the market at the time. I mean, the course of building the distribution network's been in the making since the end of 2018. So last year we did reach a pretty good saturation point. Uh, I don't think we have Utah quite up and running based on some regulatory things that we have to work through there and Alaska and Hawaii. And I think the, the what, one other state I'm forgetting is probably a little small territory, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's been just trying to make sure we had the right partners. And of course, um, getting the people to believe is, is, is so important for our 
company our size as well as a product because it's it's a mind share game out there in the field and you know hard coffee doesn't move like light beer or seltzer so it's but it does have a right to win in the store and, and it's incremental to a lot of shopper baskets and retailers make more margin on it so there's there's a right to win for us for sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> to that point, you know, it's interesting. You've mentioned a couple of times, like the perfect first drink, right? Mm -hmm. I guess that probably has borne itself out in your research because it's like, well, why would you limit the volume opportunity? Right. Why would they just have one, but you probably know you, the answer. You could have more. I, I've talked to a consumer <laughs> that said they might drink a whole four pack. And, and I think that's a little bit more abnormal perhaps. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, it, it was something like 93% drink it in the first position in their session, you know, mm. something over to the 90% mark that, that drink it as that first one versus the second or third, because yeah. If you drink a, a cab at dinner and have a nice glass of wine, you're less likely to displace that, you know, in that situation. Right. And, and also our consumers a little bit, a little bit more mature in their drinking. It's not an efficiency drinking play anymore. Um, you know, they're more mid twenties into mid thirties, but we see everybody, you know, 21 and over drinking us, but our, our tor target core consumer is definitely, if you're going to have one drink, you know, if uh, like I have young kids and you're going to have one drink, you want something that tastes great and is high quality. You don't want something that's just a, uh, delivering a vessel of the alcohol. So we, we see we see a little bit more of a maturity uh, level within our consumer. And that tends to be that first drink because they might not get a second or third one. Got it. Interesting. And then also, you know, you were mentioning at the outset, you have a pretty robust uh, line of different differentiated ideas, but what is mm -hmm. the one thing that kind of unites your proposition? What's, what's your angle? Is it functional or, or what else is the white space you're serving? Yeah, from a brand perspective, it's definitely at the simplest level, flavor and experience. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, we look to the coffee house, coffee house culture to some degrees, kind of using, uh, I worked in, in grocery and food in my past life uh, before coming over to the, the elk side. And we always looked at the trends in the white tablecloth restaurants and looking to the master chefs that are leading, leading those trends in the coffee house culture, as well as the on-premise culture are those leaders and experimenters. So taking things and putting them together that you wouldn't expect otherwise. And so really keeping tabs on that. So if you, if you see that across our line, you know, there is a coffee house culture nature uh, from teas to juice to coffee, but really that linchpin between them all from a brand perspective has got to deliver on flavor. If it doesn't do that, then we don't feel comfortable launching it. And, and our R and D teams world-class too. They they've come from an eclectic background and from non-elk as well and, and hold PhDs and they have uh, you know several patents and, and all of that. And so I think kind of having that fresh perspective on a beverage has been beneficial for the liquids we've developed along the way too. Cool. I think that's most of what I had to ask, but um, let me ask you this. What's sure. the suggested re retail price for your lead packs? And are you seeing that under pressure at all right now? It's definitely pressure as everybody's yeah. experienced in, in uh, themes on all fronts, at least <laughs> from cans to cardboard to, to sure. transportation costs. Uh, but a typical four pack of hard coffees is $9.99 to $10.99, depending on the marketplace. Um, you'll, you'll definitely see some interesting price points on features. And then with the variety packs, anywhere from $18.99 to $19.99, maybe $20.99 on the coffee. Tea's a little bit of a different position on the variety pack. That's more $15.99 to $16.99. But ju juice and tea will be line priced from a retail perspective. So that way we get you know, great display executions next to each other. I can't wait to see a nice column of a purple box of hard juice next to our blue box of hard tea. It can't come soon enough. <laughs> right. And is the coffee more expensive because it's coffee and coffee drinkers are... Yeah, the, I mean, the, the ingredient deck, 100% uh, Arabica coffee, as well as milk, sugar, you know, cream, uh, just, it's just a little different overall experience there, you know, versus, versus tea or, or juice extracts. Well, Sarge, now that we're friends, I can call you Sarge. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I was uh, turned on to your show by a colleague that joined us in the last, um, oh, probably four or five months. And I've probably rifled through about 10 to 12, 12 of them. And they've been quite enjoyable and hearing different perspectives from small, medium, large folks in the industry. Uh, thank you guys for letting us come on and tell our story. Oh, yeah. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, Love thank hearing you. that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we look forward to seeing more of what you guys have in the market and to, to sharing some of these to kick yeah, off the well, night. Well, definitely when we get the juice and the uh, the hard brunch together, we'll, we'll put together some care packages so you guys can sample them as well. Sweet. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers all. Thank you.